Cool. Well, uh, we might as well start. Um, I'm, I'm letting a few more people in, but, but I'll do that as and when. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. Uh, really excited about tonight's event. I'm Rory here at Oliver Bernard. Um, just to give a quick bit of background before we start, you might have seen us um, uh, do a few events, a few of my colleagues in other areas of technology and myself with Go over the last weeks and months, um, especially in lockdown as well. So, um, yeah, but from the Go side, um, been trying to push forward the language, um, get more content out right. into the community, um, which is uh, what's, what's led us to tonight. Um, so, yeah, really, really excited. Um, this is basically, as you would have seen, a chance for people who don't have any experience or limited experience with the language um, to find out a bit more about it, um, have a chance to build their own application, which Art will lead us through and everything like that. So just a few quick things before I hand over. I will be recording this event and sticking it online afterwards. So uh, feel free to have a look at that if there's anything you've, uh, you've sort of missed through today. Um, any questions you have as we're going on, uh, just stick it in the chat function zoom i'll keep an eye on that and, and i'll leave arta to to basically lead us through um but yeah really excited this is something i want to do for a while um this sort of event so yeah um i'll hand over to you mate oh cool so hello everybody welcome welcome to our golang in london first run i guess this is the first run of online workshops my name is artur kondas i'm a Go developer at ecs digital and today we will build something fun. So we run the poll on what you want to see us build. And uh, well, the thing that won was to how to actually stream and play music in your terminal. So this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to share the screen now um, and we'll walk you through everything. Probably, hopefully you can see everything. Um, like 100% you can see. If you can't, just let me know. I'm going to zoom everything in. So, uh, without further ado, I think we can roll. The first thing um, before we even start, before we even begin, is if you want to, if you don't want to code with us as we go along, if you just want to have code in front of you and just see how it looks, you can go to github.com, Yoshi uh, Golang in London music player so if you go there you will uh, you will see the whole repository uh the whole code uh with the whole readme so after the event you can go with the video as well you can go with the sold readme and just basically crack on and build it yourself okay that said um i will answer all the questions straight after we finish so if you have any as rory said uh, just smack them in the chat. I'm more than happy to help you. I'm more than happy to talk you through stuff and show that Go literally is amazing. Okay. So for those who are first time with Go this time, uh, what is Go? Go is a programming language uh, developed at Google by Rob Pike, Robert, Gris Robert Griezmann and Ken Thompson. Uh, two of these guys worked on Unix systems. Uh, Mr. Griezmann worked on Chrome V8 uh, JavaScript engine. So, well, the, the combined knowledge of these three guys, it's immense. It's insane. Uh, released in November 2009, we are on version uh, 1.14. Beta is 1.15, I guess. Um, yeah, and we went with Go from the very beginning of small language that might be something else than C into a fully fledged behemoth of cloud tools. So what? Kubernetes is written in Go. Docker is written in Go. Anything that comes from HashiCorp <laughs> is written in Go. A lot of stuff is written in Go, which actually makes it really exciting in my head. Um, but the one thing that a lot of people miss in this whole vast big cloud environment is that Go is actually fun. Uh, Go makes a lot of code readable from ground up, uh, which, well, you know, I, I like code that you can just read. You don't have to worry about uh, someone not understanding Java.java.java. .java .java. 
And, you know, that's somewhere between 1% to 10%, the total number of atoms in. Um, sorry, sorry, guys. Um, can everyone just make sure they've muted their mic? Um, we're getting a bit of playback from a few people at the moment. I'm more than happy mute, to have a chat great. later on. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, but it's like, um, so a bit of my background, so you will know how I look at, uh, how I see Go. Um, before doing Go full-time, I've used to do, well, basically everything. I've used to do JavaScript and Node, which I'm not very proud of, but it paid the bills. Um, I've used to do a bit of Java, C++. Uh, I even used to do C and Assembly for a second. Um, but then Go came along, uh, one of my very dear friend just told me hey this is the thing you need to learn this is the thing you need to do and i was like well, okay at the time i haven't had anything really serious on my plate so i went okay let's roll and here i am right now writing a lot of uh fun stuff in go okay before i will go everywhere no pun intended here um i'm using vim if you don't use vim uh feel free to use any ide uh, I won't do any magic tricks in Vim. I won't do any macros whatsoever. Uh, that said, in the left-hand corner, uh, you can see that every single uh, key I will press, you will see. So if you are trying to get into Vim, you will see all the movements I do. So that should be helpful. Uh, on my machine, um, I have Go 1.14. Uh, Readme goes with you on how to install go so if you don't have go on your uh on your machine just go to, to the github repo and just follow through the readme okay let's crack on i'm gonna move into my desktop and i'm just gonna create a small um a small directory here so let's call it golang music player mkcd is uh it's a small alias I have for make directory and then change directory. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly too lazy to type one after the other. So this is, this is the reason why I have it. Okay. Once we have that, um, we have to enable something which is called Go modules. Go modules are the way how we deal with dependencies in Go. So before that, we were using GoPath. Um, so you had one path in your on your machine that Go knew where to look for all the dependencies, all the packages. Right now you can use Go mod. I I'm kind of torn between those two. I sometimes use this, sometimes use that, depending on the situation, depending on the occasion. Uh, but for this one, we will run um, Go modules. So to be actually sure that we are we are allowed to do set up Go modules, we have to do export go all caps one 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 modules on i hope yep so what this will say um it will say that we are actually capable of running go modules in this directory so now i can do go mod init and i'm just gonna call it music player and as you can see we've created a new file which is go mod let's let's check it so go mod has nothing in it right now and that's fine for now we'll see how it uh, how it will populate itself as 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 we go along maybe not itself but this is another another meetup we can have on how go mod works actually um one question that you might have is okay but what if i want to have packages how do i do the go modules then then you have to actually be more careful about how you do stuff and actually think a bit more intensive how you do stuff. And I'm, well, give me one second. I want to move this a bit. Yes, now it's better. Cool. All right. So once we have that, let's actually start. So we have the modules. Let's have, let's create the file. Uh, for our application, we'll keep everything in one file, mostly because, well, it's simple. The application is going to be very straightforward. It's going to be rather, rather fast. So there's no need to split into modules. There's no need to um, actually abstract the interface we'll work with. So vim main.go and let's roll. 
Um, okay, so we have our empty file. Now what to do with it? If you're coming from Java, if you're coming from C, C++, this will feel very home-like. So package main um, tells the compiler, tells the Go compiler that this package, this, this files will have to be bundled together and we'll have to create one executable file from it. If you choose anything else then, it will yell at you, hey, it's not package main, I don't know what to do about it. So then don't panic. This is actually how it, how it has to work. So if you use modules to do something else, to import it into your code from various places, that's how we do it. And that's how we deal with it. Um, okay, I like to actually mock a bit of imports for my code. Uh, most of the time, uh, as you can see here, Vim Go does, does it for me. But for the sake of uh, our workshop right now, I've, I didn't want to do everything by Vim Go, so you, you won't go, I don't know what, you, what you're doing, man. It's like, please, please tell me. Okay, so we will import two packages for now. We'll import OS and we will import log. So, um, what is import? Well, import is, again, rather straightforward. It imports stuff into our code. If you see something like this, so if you see OS log, if you see something like that, uh, this is imported from the standard library that Go has inbuilt. Um, Go kind of boasts about being a programming language that has battery include, batteries included. So what, that's, what this means is that, for example, if you have to write a web server in Node, you have to load in Express, you have to load in some middleware to parse the bodies. Um, I don't know how it looks with Dino right now, but I have to check it. Um, you have to load multitude of stuff. Whereas with Go, you can literally build your web server from ground up. You don't have to import anything. You can build a lot of stuff from ground up just by getting the uh, Go distribution into your code, which I think is amazing. Okay, once we have that, we need the main function that our code will know where to look at. So, func. Uh, func is the way how we describe functions in Go. So in any other language apart from F sharp, uh, you just write function or in most of the most of the languages. In here, we'll just write func, which is quick and simple. And then we type main. So each uh, executable written in Go has to have func main because this is the function that the, compi that the, that the compiler looks for. So it has to have some entry point. And then you can expand however you like. But this is the initial, this is the, the, the very ground up. This is the fundament of the house we're gonna build. Okay, once we have that, let's actually talk about the, the application we're gonna build because uh, I just figured out that I haven't talked about it. So what we are going to build now is a player that will allow us to play MP3s specifically mp3s in our terminal um why is that well i don't like to leave my terminal for anything i even wrote uh, a wiki checker for my terminal that if i need to wiki something fast i can just type wiki and then it fetches it for me um, even if i do a github repos i just type gu and then it sets up the repo for me and everything and uh, do all the remotes so the same goes here. Um, I was working on integration of Spotify in the terminal, and then I figured out that someone did it before me and it's better. And even if I play Spotify, I do it in terminals. So that's the reason why I came up with this idea. Okay, so we have this, beautiful. The first bit is to load the file. So how to do that? So in Go, we have this beautiful function. And then we were, we are going to load, I'm just going to import it later on, test mp3. Okay. But this function right now on its own doesn't return anything or it doesn't know where to return. So always open, we'll return the file and we'll return the error. 
So we can return the file, return the error, and then do this. If you see this beautiful thingy in the code, this is the assignment operator. So in Go, you can do something like um, this, and this will, this will create the uh, variable of type string of name f. Then you can expand that and you can do var of string and actually assign some value. But as you can see, this grows to be overly verbose. But then what you can do is this. So the line 13 and the line 14 are basically the same. So the, it works the same, but in this case, our compiler is actually um, smart enough that it knows that F will be of type string because it inherits the right hand um, type. Okay. So we have this, and this is um, a reason why a lot of my Java friends are mocking me for writing Go, because every time you need to check the error, you just do, if error is not nil. Um, if you will write any time a production grade code, production ready Go code, or any type of Go, this is something you will see a lot. A lot of people does this. So they create a function to check the error. A lot of tutorials I saw uh, back in the day did that. I'm not a very big fan of this because it kind of limits you from how you can deal with the error. Because sometimes you will have to deal with the error in some different way. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of old school if you can say with doing this type of checks. So if the error is not nil, nil is the null value, is the, is the zero value in Go. So different types have different zero values. In case of error, it's nil. We don't have a concept of null. We don't have, we don't have the concept of undefined. You can see that uh, Vim is yelling at me that, okay, you've created that, but you're not using it. So please do something with it. Um, so yeah. I, I just went with my train of thoughts. Okay, cool. So we have the error. We know that it is not nil. So something has happened. So we need to inform the user that something has happened. So we can do this. And log fatal is amazing. I use it a lot of, I like literally a lot because log does two things. So it does log print. So this one, Print to the standard output. And then the other thing that it does, it calls OS exit. So it exits the um, the executable, it exits the, the runtime with an error because one stands for the error. So we know that there's something wrong with the application. Although this one, as you can see, probably is not the nicest way how you can handle the error because maybe it would be nice to actually notify the user that something is, is wrong. Um, I will use that in the next example so you can see how these two approaches differ. Um, and we will check uh, hopefully some, no, okay. Okay, I can even see the, okay, cool. So we have that, okay. Tap, tap, tap. Cool, all right, so we have the file. We know that there is no error, what to do next? So once we have that, we have to set up the streamer, we have to set up the format, and we have to check the error when we're gonna decode the, the file. So what we will be using for our uh, MP3 player thing is an amazing library for Fayface. So that's, uh, that's a developer on GitHub, which is called Beep. Um, if you're new to Go, the one of the very big things that drew me to Go, to, to actually write Go, is the community. So there's a lot of people that will help you with writing your Go code. There's a lot of people will, that will actually go an extra mile to teach you how the Go code should look like and should work. Uh, I'm a self-taught developer. 
that said, um, I went to GopherCon last year, meet a ton of really great people which helped me along the way. So if you need one reason to get into Go, that's the major one. Like the community is insanely good. Even if you just want to do open source stuff, Go. No pun intended again. Okay. So we need to set up the streamer format and check port error. Cool. Okay, we have that. So we need a streamer in the format and we need to check the error. So once we have that, we need to call the function that will do that for you, for us. MP3 decode F. So right now you might be thinking, okay, where is that MP3 from? So I'm just gonna do this. Yep. Uh, so my Vim setup uh, imports all the libraries for me if I have them set up. Uh, in this case, we will use the sub library from Beep, which is MP3, which decodes the file for us. Okay, so we now have um, three things to deal with. We have the streamer, as you can see, we have the format, and then we have our error. So the first thing, yes. Hi, Arthur. Yes. Sorry, if I'm following along, how do I go about installing that? So I don't have to set up in Vim, but I've got the terminal stuff sorted. So how do I okay. install it that is, actually, that is actually a really good question. So anytime you do stuff like that, if you're using Go modules, you can literally type it here. So you can literally type as I go along within the import. And then when you do Go run at the end, it will populate itself. That's the first, uh, that's the first, way you can do that. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can do go get and then github com face beep. One of these two. Cool. So, um, as I said, my Vim setup, and I, will, and, I, and I will go over that uh, at the very end, um, I kind of tweaked my Vim to do a lot of stuff for me. I will point you to what's what's doing what uh, but yeah if you're using go modules you can literally type it in the import and then by the time we will finish it will populate itself but this is a very good question that's really good okay cool uh, hello Arthur. So, yes hi uh, a, a question from my side is like you know the, uh, uh, the functions that you're using for the libraries is there any uh, documentation available on the command line or anything available like Java docs similar to? Yep, 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 yep. I actually like these questions, yes. Cool, so Go has, the very big thing about Go is the documentation itself. So I don't know if I have the browser open. I, I should have the browser open. So if you go to GitHub, I, I, and then you can have the Goldag reference. So Go, uh, behind the Go docs, there is an idea that every single word matters. So as you said, uh, in Java, when you have the documentations, well, the documentation is gonna be obscenely huge. Well, this is how Java is. It is an enterprise language, so it has to cover all the angles. Whereas in Go, when you have the documentation, it's very straight to the point. So like it will literally define the function in one sentence or less. So if, if we choose anything, here you go. Streak sim closer is a union of sim streaker and sim closer. So like we can go deeper and then you can see every single one, what it does, and for every single type, you can see, well, what the, what the types are in the, in the interfaces or in the structs. The way how I like to approach this is that whenever I want to write something, whenever I start writing something from scratch, I just go with the documentation. This is a very nice refreshing thing 
if you if you code anything that you don't have to find a medium guy that did it before you and then you follow along with this tutorial and then you build up i think most of you probably know what i'm uh, what i'm about in go you can find the library go to the documentation and just roll with it go actually uh allows you to create the, the documentation for the code you're writing but we won't cover that here because then we're going to extend to such monstrous um sizes that we won't cover that in the next two hours <laughs> okay if someone has any other question before i go further please speak now or wait till the end <laughs> so arthur i was mm. going to ask is there like a um like a central repository like npm or maven or um, of, of like uh, modules and go like that or do you have to like import everything from like github like you're doing like right now so um the way how npm works as you said is a basically a repository of things so the only good thing about npm is that it actually gets everything in one place and you can find everything go has this bit but then you will end up uh yeah so you can search for the package so this is the equivalent of npm that said this is the second time in my career as a Go developer I ever had to go here because whenever I want to write something and I want to use a new package, what I do, I just literally go to GitHub, type what I need to do. And there's like 95% chance that from the keywords, I will find the proper package, which is, which is great, I think. But yeah, if you if you thinking about npm for Go, you have Go to Dev. Any more also, questions? Yeah, uh, is it? Uh, Avi. Uh, so I think is it like a npm install is very similar to Go get, and pip install they're kind of same. So huh, this is this is tricky one because npm behind the scenes does a lot of stuff uh, you kind of don't need it to. Whereas go get basically inherently what it does, it's a git clone or, uh, well, basically it is a git clone and then it puts the package in the right directory. This is the great thing about go that if you don't know how something works, if you want to learn how the insights of Go works, you can literally go to the source code and you will be able to, to work it out. This is a very nice thing. Uh, with NPM, the amount of stuff that it fetches around for any subsequent package and then does stuff behind the scenes, well, this is a, this is a proper pop talk. like. We can, we can then trash talk how JavaScript does it and how JavaScript has a new framework every 15 minutes. But yeah, we won't do that now. Okay, okay. So one last sure, question sure. then. So what about transitive dependencies? So if like, um, you know, this deep MP3 depends on something else, how, mm. I, mean, I mean, do you have to go and get that manually or will go get, go and get it for you? I, I really like guys, these questions. This is nice. <laughs> so, Go modules actually does that for you. Even before Go modules, even before we used that, even before uh, we had to use um, Go path, it was dealing, it was doing that for us. So whenever you do Go get, it will fetch the main repo and then fetch any subsequent repo if the package demands it. That said, um, there is a very, I found there is a very big, um, um, I'm looking for a right word, pride, if that makes sense, to write the packages to not be dependent on something else. So in this case, um, the reason for that is that the beep package has a few more subsequent packages. So when you do go get github.com slash fayface slash beep, it will fetch all the packages from the beep repository. Which is, which is great. So then if you use MP3, actually it's within here. 
yeah uh, and then we're gonna step stop the questions for now I will do two more question sessions so if you have some then uh, please hold up for a second and then we will continue okay let's check the error so if the error is not nil um, as I said in here we will be more verbose to the user that something has broken down and something is not right so we can do log again fatal because we want to and then we're gonna do f so if you're coming from c again this means that we can format the string format the template for the string uh, to actually inform the user in the more specific way i'm looking if there is any more errors here to do no this is the only one so we will say error while um decoding into mp3 value and then we're going to start the new line just for the sake of the new line and then we're going to print the error that in this case like if someone will look at the terminal they will be able to say okay this is broken here which is which is great i guess okay one last thing before we move into meat and bones of the application is to use the fur Streamer close. Okay. So if you want to learn more about Defer, there is a very good talk uh, from Matt Raya uh, about what is Defer. I will just keep it very, very high level for you guys. So Defer in Go code is a keyword, like you can see that it has changed the color. Uh, it is a keyword that says that this, whatever is on the right hand side, has to be evaluated, has to be run after the outbound function exits. So the moment main ends is its life, then we run just before that, in this, in this millisecond, we run the streamer.close. Um, where will you see that? Well, basically every time you will run any sort of API. And the truth is, if you will get a Go job, you will either work with Bitcoin because Go is fast and then it works very well in FinTech, or you will write um, a lot of APIs. And in API, you have to remember to close the stream from the body. So in our case, this streamer will actually stream something for us. And if our code base grows, in this case, we wouldn't have to worry about it because when main finishes its life, well, the application ends, the, the whole runtime ends. But if you build a very big application, if you forget to, to, to close the stream, you're kind of on a very finicky ground because then what if I have a memory leak? How do I find it? So you have to think about this stuff. And you might say right now, why? Why can I just code stuff and don't care about it? Well, the reason is that maybe you want to do something else with that stream. Maybe you don't want to close it before it ends. Maybe you want to pass it to something, to something else. Go allows you to do whatever your heart desires. As long as you're, well, kind of okay with what you code, then you can do whatever. <laughs> okay. So we have the streamer, we have the format, we need something to play the music through. Okay, so we need to set up the speaker. So I'm, I'm doing that from my head because I wrote the application a few times. Uh, if you're wondering how the heck I'm getting all of these, if you go to Fayface, uh, Beep, they have very nice tutorials on how to set up those things, uh, which goes in the greater detail about what we're doing here. Okay, so speak in it in it if you if you see in it you can always assume that it does something to initialize a variable for us um, a lot of packages in go have some sort of init or initialize which helps in the longer run that you don't have to re re relearn the whole library from the ground up because a lot of things will be the same as it was in the previous one or in the next one you will use. So we have the speaker in it and now we have to set up the sample rate 
and um, the latency buffer for our for our uh, application. I'm just going to write it and then I'm going to explain what what is going on. Sample rate. Okay. If there's anyone here that deals with music or has been recording any music, um, you will probably have cold shivers when looking at the sample rate. Um, and there's no need to have those cold shivers. So what speakerInit does, it has uh, two parameters. So the first one is the sample rate for the speaker. So in terms of computer audio, the sample rate is how fast, how quickly the sample should be, pu should be pushed to the output. Uh, also, it inherently sets up how nice the quality of the um, audio you will play will be. The higher the sample rate, the better the quality, but, higher, but the, the size of the file is higher. The lower the sample rate, well, the, the file is way smaller. So if you need something to compare that, uh, for example, Spotify, whenever it streams something, it streams on 48K uh, Hertz. So the samples are played across the whole virtual media around 48K Hertz. But if you play something from the CD, the sample rate will be two or four times higher than this, because this is why we go with the mixing and mastering. And if your friend says that they've spent a lot of money for mixing and mastering, they actually did because it is costly. It's actually very costly. Okay, and the second one is the buffer. Think about the buffer in audio about a trade-off between how stable the playback is and how big the latency is. In our case, well, we don't have to worry about this that much, but if you are recording something uh, on your computer, you will be allowed to set the buffer. If you go very hard to the left, so the buffer will be very small, then you will hear a lot of pops, a lot of all that stuff because the buffer is so low that latency is very low, but the buffer itself, it's not stable. If you go to the far right, then the buffer, well, it's bigger. So it's very stable. It sounds very good, but in order to have this buffer very stable, we have to increase the latency. So it is in digital audio, it is a trade-off between how stable something is and how quick we can respond to, to the input, how quick we can transfer the input back to the player. In our case, we uh, set one tenth of sample rate, which I think, I think in this case, it's, it's a good trade-off between how stable the playback will be and how big the latency will be. Okay. And this is the meat and bones of, of Go. I'll just do this. Okay. So one of the very, very good things about Go is that it has a first class um, concurrency model in it. What does what this means for us is that we are able to build concurrent applications on basically each level of the application. So to bring it a bit more to the layman terms, it means that if we need to do something, some operations in the same time, we are allowed to do so, and we are allowed to do so in a very memory safe environment. So in order to communicate between those threads, we have to have some sort of communication device. In Go, we have channels. So we can, well, basically we can push something to the channel. We can get, get something back from the channel. Uh, we can communicate between different streams or different threads in Go. We call them Go routines. We can communicate between those uh, using channels. 
So I'm just gonna spill the beans a bit now. I'll do this. So right now, the down, down channel, this one, will be blocking. So if we wouldn't have this, if we would just forget about it, and I will just do play the music here. The way how beep library works is that whenever we play the song, well, it will be um, sort of some sort of a stream. So it will be a go routine. Go routines doesn't wait. If it runs, then it runs, and then the whole rest of the application runs. So if we would play the music here, we wouldn't hear anything. And why is that? Because Go doesn't care if the Go routine that has been spawned has finished or not. So we need some sort of mechanism to say to main that, hey, hold up, hold up. There's a Go routine that is playing in the background somewhere and we need to actually, well, do something with it. We need to wait for it. So that's why you can use channels to actually communicate and you will see that in a second, to actually say to our main outbound function that, okay, once this done, then you can deal with stuff. Um, in terms of production, again, how you can think about it. Um, if you worked with Kubernetes or any sort of task orchestrator, how this works, it gets a task, I'm not talking about queues, if it gets some tasks, then it distributes them. It doesn't wait for anything. It just distributes them. It doesn't care. It cares where it goes, but then it just takes a task, get on with it, and just whatever happens later on, I don't care because I've, de I've deployed the task. So in Go, you can have, I wrote this many times, you can have a small application that will get multiple things in, and then it will distribute evenly or not, however you design it, it will distribute the data across subscribers. So it allows you to do a lot of stuff. And although this might sound right now a bit high level, in reality is not that because, well, let's, let's see for ourselves. So we need to play something for the speaker. So we have the dot play function in the speaker and then we do this Beep sequenced. We need to set up the streamer. Tap. Yep, closed. So what happened now is this, this function here, beep sequence, um, allows us to set up a callback. So once this function finishes, same as we had the fur, we can have a callback that will do something while the, when the function finishes. In our case, we don't want to do anything, literally anything, apart from communicating with the channel that, okay, my Go routine has finished. Whatever I need to do has finished. You can wrap up the shop, and we don't care about it. So that said, um, if you if you have any questions right now, now is a very good time to ask them. Uh, hello, Arthur. Yep. A question from my side. So uh, within that script, the last commands that you showed, like you know, look like kind of a function nested kind of a function invocation. Uh, yes. Does that actually replace all the piece of code that you have written up till now? No. So I'm, I will change the directory. Um, I will tell you why. Uh, um, go lang. So this is the same code. You don't have to worry about anything. Um, I will go into main.go. Okay. So this function doesn't replace anything. So what this means, if I, if I will have to break it down. So first, get something to play. Then second, stream it somewhere. In our case, it's the streamer. 
then third thing once it's done then um, call the callback this is very badly written but I hope you will you will know what I'm about and then in the callback we want to say to the go routine uh, say to the channel that uh, go routine Yep. Does that make sense? Uh, I did not, I'm not able to understand uh, the bib dot sequence and we are sending streamer and bib dot callback. So are we expecting something out or it's like a sequential call? No. So we actually expect something here. So I hope that you will be able to hear my laptop sound. Can you see, can you hear the music? Uh, not really, no. Okay, so that's that's what I thought. So if you copy the repo we have, it actually has this beautiful file here. So in order for you your code to actually run, you have to supply it with something. So here in the test mp3, take any mp3 file and just hit it so if you go to uh to my github fetch the repo and do go that run you will get the whole running thing so basically this one well it is a nested function basically because we are passing into our go speaker.play another function that passes another function which makes it a bit tricky but it's not because actually we have oh, so the point zero would be here uh tell speaker to play something so we have the speaker that will play something but in order to play something we need to actually stream something to the speaker so although this one uh, might tell you that it is a sequential code then we would have to delve into how do we define sequential code what do we what do you mean about what do you mean saying sequential code in this case it is not a sequential code there's a sequence sequence code if that makes sense so we take the the whole song and if you go behind the scenes, if you go behind the sound, what this song really is, is basically a chunk of chunks of bytes. So you have one small chunk of byte, another small chunk of byte, etc., 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 etc. And then this one actually sets up how many bytes you will allow to play in a given time. So that's why we have the buffer and the sample rate set up that we said to our code, okay, for this many, in within one second, play this many chunks of our stream. So this sequencer, sequencer actually takes some chunks, spit it out within a second, and then it repeats until it depletes the length of the file. Does that help a bit? Yes, that does help. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, another question that I have yep. is like uh, within the play, the way in which we have invoked the functions, uh, can we also have multiple statements getting invoked from a function in this format? Yep. Um, so it all boils down to what you have to do. Well, period, basically. Um, you can have a lot of things spawned from within the function and I will show you what can you do later on but I will pin that question in for a second so I will I will get back to it in a sec. Any more question guys? Don't be scared I won't bite you. Uh, just one question around uh, uh, that saying concurrency or go routines are the first class citizens in go yeah. you say, yeah so uh coming from a different background like java and scala or even javascript have that a uh, there is a concept of futures and promises uh yeah. i don't think go has all these things like futures and promises unless you write it like a custom 
be. Yes, unless unless you will customize that, it doesn't. So you might be thinking, okay, then it's not full, which is a very big no no, because if you think about promise, what is promise in JavaScript? The promise is in the very layman terms, you evaluate something and you kind of hope it will return something. Either it's an error or it's a value you're looking for. Yep. In our case, we can create the channel that will anticipate the return from something. So this is what we actually did. We opened up the channel here on line 28. And then on line 30, when something finish, we just populate the channel. We just send something to the channel. So in this case, like you can think about channels the same way as you think about promises. Uh, but in Go, it does way more than this. Right. So uh, in case, uh, sorry, another question on back of it. Sorry. Yeah, it will no be worries. short. Uh, so in cases like futures and promises, we kind of tend to use something like an option monad sort of thing, which has sometimes some value or none sort of yeah. thing. So, but I don't think Go has, does that Go has anything like an optional or option thing? Mm, so I don't actually think it does that. It, it does have options or monads. Uh, but then, like if you ask yourself the question, how many times you used monad? And so like uh, in my head, monads are very Java or Scala kind of mm -hmm. thing. So this is how I tend to think about them. Um, if you think about monads, then you kind of, in my head at least, you see that they have very specific um, usage. Like if you use a monad, you actually know why it's there for and it has one very specific usage in your code base. Like if we go very high and then we go very in depth, that, that came out really wrong. Uh, if we go very in depth in the code, yeah, okay. But from my experience, Go like completely abandons all of these very high level abstractions. So Go tries to be more readable than most of the languages. So like, even if you go with, with this code, the only thing that might be a bit scary is this bit, because we don't know what the channel is. We don't know what the channel does, but every single, every other thing goes in a very Pythonian like way. So we want our code to be readable. Although if you come from Python, you might be taken aback by the curly braces. I like them. Um, but yeah, well, that's, that's the thing basically. So if it's basically if a channel, we are expecting say a value, this will be the last question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, so if I call something, which is like asynchronous in nature, and I'm yeah. trying to get something back in a channel. I have to know the data type of the channel, which I'm expecting from that asynchronous call, basically. So this is a very good question, actually. So if you think about it, um, Go on in its very core is a strongly typed language. So whenever you will initialize something, it would be actually good to know the type of the initialized thing or to at least know what it will be. So that's why my channel here was a simple Boolean. So it either sends true or false. If it sends true, then well, something happened in the channel. Uh, we might have another discussion about generics in Go, which will probably come later this year. Uh, today, the Go committee uh, released a very long paper about how they want to implement generics in Go, which is very long and I, went like 100th of it, but it will be fun. Uh, but that said, you can do something like this. Yeah. So this magical thing, interface in Go can be basically anything. Don't think about it as a generic. Think about it as it can inherit any type that will be thrown at it. So then we could rewrite this. 
So I will do this. What if I don't? Yeah. So if we'll do this, uh, crap. Then I can do something like this, which basically, um, from the ground up, is the same thing. So here I return to this channel, which I know will be of type boolean, of, of type true or false. I'm returning a true value. And this channel, I, ha I know it's a type of interface. So it's a type of something. So then I actually return something to it. If I want to return a string, I will be allowed to because the interface will inherit whatever that is. So you might be thinking right now, probably, uh, that, hey, this might be the way to go. No pun intended again. Uh, but in the real life scenarios, if you're using channel for more than blocking things, so as we did here, it's actually nice to anticipate what will be returned from the channel to do something with it. So not to have, you know, something dangling around in the abyss to do something with it. The same as you go with JavaScript. If you call asynchronous on something and you expect the promise and then you do try catch and checks of the errors, of course, because we like, we are very good programmers. We check our errors. Um, if you anticipate something, then you will do something with that value. You're, you, you're not calling asynchronous code just to run and then don't care about it. If, if that's what the application needs to do, yeah, that's fine. But nine out of 10, I can bet you any money that you're calling the asynchronous function to do something for you and then return the value later on. I hope that answers the question. Sure, sure, bit. thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks yeah, a lot. no worries. Cool, okay. So um, if you changed the file here, it will play the song. Um, sadly, I don't know if I can share my audio from the uh, from my laptop. I'm gonna check the chat. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Dependency of dependencies. Yeah. Fair point. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I assume not. So once we have that, then what's next for us in the shop? What can we do later on? Um, the first thing I would be thinking about is maybe speed up the song or distort the song or do a small remix within our application. So the thing you can play with would be uh, will be here because this bit, the buffer and the sample rate will actually decide how fast the, the song should be played or not. So that would be the first thing. The second thing would be, okay, what if I want to play some other song? What if I don't want to be bound into this one song we've hard coded into our code? So then maybe let's build a CLI out of it which is actually very fun. And if you want to do something nice with Go, I really, 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 really uh, recommend that. We can do that. Maybe build a small UI for, uh, for the application. Um, Go, this is the only thing I haven't found yet in the standard library, which is a nice way to build UIs. Go is very, backend like I like backend I like backend technologies I like databases I like nitty-gritty of the application so go works perfectly for me um, but that said if you want to write um, a new wine go it's gonna be a bit harder but we go supports WebAssembly so it compiles down to WebAssembly you can compile go to JavaScript um, 
through the compiler, obviously. Um, there is a very nice library which is called GOUI, uh, written by Elias Now. I think I pronounced that correctly. Uh, and this guy wrote a whole thing on how to write a UI with the, with his uh, library in Go, which is very nice. Um, yeah. Also, before we before we go, this is how Go mod looks after we finish. So in our case, we just have one single dependency um, on which our code depends, which our which our code needs uh, to run, but when your application grows and you will have more than this, well, the Go mod uh, will extend. The Go mod is our, which versions of the repositories, which versions of the packages we used at a certain time. So it depicts the, the version of Go and then it depicts uh, which versions of which libraries we used. Um, okay, so that said, If you don't have any questions, um, I will, well, thank you very much for joining us in this small meetup. I will just stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us in this meetup. Um, if you want to read more from my end or learn more about Go, you can go. Here. Is it com? I don't remember my own domain. Yeah, but I think here, if you if you go here, then you can read more tutorials about Go, how Go works. Um, if you have any more questions, like the last last type of questions, now is the time to run them through me. Uh, if not, then again, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and actually having fun with us. Actually, I have another question. Sorry, should keep me. coming back. Yeah. Uh, last last one, last one for the day. <laughs> um, so I was uh, looking again around the concurrency thing uh, because I okay. keep on coming back to the future and promise thing. See, what's the, like, uh, as you've been working as a Go professional engineer for quite a some time, say I want to invoke a REST API, a third yeah. party REST API, anything. So is it always better to do it uh, as a, like a con using the concurrency model? model? or just invoke it like a request get sort of thing? So this is, um, this is like you would ask me, um, if I go to a pub, should I, drunk, should I drink the same pint I always order or should I do something else? And it depends. So I can't give you the very concrete answer on what you should do. This should be dependent on the code you write. So in my case, um, I write a lot of services that deals with stuff in a different way. So some of my services, some of my APIs will have to wait until it will get the um, data and then work on it. But then I have APIs that does four things at the same time. I don't care which one is the first one because they are not depending on each other. And then by the end of it, I will concatenate whatever it is here and then work on it. So the first one, I would just do a request, check if there's an error, very nice, very slow paced code. In the other way, I would have a channel which will um, keep the data flowing as, as it has to, and then it will block the outside function to exit, and then run all four calls independently as a go routine, the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, return something from to the to me and then I will work with it. So again, it depends. There's no concrete answer on that. Right, thank you. So in the second scenario, you mean the four things will run asynchronously actually? Yes. So won't so wait for each other. So they want, so like, if you think about asynchronously, um, the question is for you, if you think about them, are they going concurrently or in parallel? In so, parallel. So that's, that's a bit of difference how you can think uh, about it. Right. Yeah, but if you, if you use Go routines, you will just run first one, run second one, run third one, right, uh, run fourth one, 
do whatever, wait, I don't know, depends on your code, then whenever all of these four will return or one of these will return, you will get it back and then work on it. How about like the four things and the first one's uh, response is, is the input for the second one? So I'm just then, sorry. I'm okay, just, yeah, 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 yeah. Then if you have this type of scenario, you can have all four Go routines running asynchronously, but then, so like, let's assume a scenario that we have second one dependent on the first one and the fourth one dependent on the third one. Like, I think that's, that's where you're going to. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we will have one channel in the third, in the first one and the same channel in the second one, then another channel in the third one and the fourth one. So the first one runs, then when it exits, it sends the signal through the channel and the second one waits for the signal on this channel and then evaluates whatever it needs to. And then the same thing happens for third and fourth. Right. Sure. You can build any sort of concurrency mechanisms however you like. Sure. Any, any, use ca any links I can read about or, uh, you know, like a sample code or something? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I think, th so the best one, uh, and that goes basically to everyone who deals with Go. Um, this is the Bible. So this is the Go programming language written by Mr. Donovan and Kernigan, this beautiful blue book thingy. If you're going with Go, um, this will be your Bible for the next few years at, at least at least to the point when we will go into Go version two. Um, I use this book as a reference every other day. I'm not an omnipotent being. I do mistakes as anybody does, and I don't code straight from my head. Um, so if you need something to reference to this thing, uh, Matt Ryer, uh, Dave Cheney, um, Rob Pike, Robert Grismy, and Ken Thompson obviously but yeah go programming language as a book if you need the reference this is this is the this is where i would look for sure thank you thanks a lot thanks. no worries man um just uh quickly i was going to answer angela's question um angela sorry uh, on the chat yes so the recording i'll be putting that on youtube uh, some point tomorrow. Um, I'll stick the link both on the event group uh, and also on LinkedIn. So keep an eye out for that um, and I'll tag Arthur in that. Um, yeah, as he said, any questions for him about the language, feel free to reach out over LinkedIn. Um, he mentioned the community a few times there. Um, can't recommend more having a look at the community. There's plenty of LinkedIn groups, um, GitHub accounts. Um, there's other meetup groups as well. Um, there, there's plenty of things out there. So please do reach out. Um, if anyone wants to talk about the Go uh, job market, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, some of you will have my emails as well. I know I've spoken to a few in the past. So yeah, please hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we will be doing more things like this as well in the coming weeks and, and months. So um, keep an eye out on, on the group and on LinkedIn. But yeah, um, thanks very much, Arthur. Really great. And, and thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you guys great. for actually spending the afternoon with us. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.